Right now, the negotiations are stalled. Um, we were asked by Speaker Pelosi, I think, to get our numbers up to two or two and a half trillion. Uh, Secretary Mnuchin said no, because the president prefers a one trillion dollar number. All right. Well, things really have not changed uh, that much since I spoke to Larry Kudlow, the White House economic advisor, 24 hours ago. The president pressing ahead with a plan to uh, push for $2,400 stimulus, $3,400 stimulus checks for families up to four. They haven't delineated uh, who gets that and uh, what individuals would get. But the fact of the matter is the president's still going along on his own because he says, well, Congress isn't. James Clyburn joins us right now, the South Carolina Democratic Congress, of course, the House Majority Whip, the man who everyone uh, obviously would readily acknowledge put uh, Joe Biden in the driver's seat after winning that state's primary, going on to take the Democratic nomination, just picking his running mate. Uh, this is the, the kingmaker, I think they call you, Congressman. So very good to have you, and, and thank you for taking the time. What do you make well, of what Larry Kudlow is saying? No deal. No deal looking good. Yeah, I heard that, but they ought to be ashamed of themselves. The fact of the matter is, we know that state and local governments need assistance. People have jobs in state and local governments. Uh, banks in little towns here in my congressional district, they are dependent upon uh, the accounts that come from state and local governments. This whole notion of not funding state and local governments is crazy talk. And I would wish that they would get serious about what the real issues are. We have a health care crisis, but we have an economic crisis. And we ought not deal with this as if there are silos here, because the health care crisis affects the economic crisis, and we cannot solve one without the other. So this whole notion of having, I got a $1 trillion program, the question is, what does it do? If you got a $1 trillion program that is totally inadequate, that doesn't make it a good program because it's small. What makes it a good program is if it gets the economy back up and running, if it gets us beyond this pandemic, which we know we got to get beyond if your program will not do that, come to the table and let's develop one that will. All right. So let's talk a little bit about what the president has proposed. We talk about this measure right now to get virus relief checks out to people, much like we did when all of this started. Um, now, he's added to that, as you know, uh, on top of the payroll tax cut that he's looking at those who earn up to $104,000 a year. Uh, extending unemployment benefits at $400 a week, $100 coming from states to kick in. And they're all the devil in the details of that and how states could afford to do that. I get that, Congressman. But by opposing what he's offering and coming up and trying to come up with another measure, do you risk looking callous that, uh, that, that he's there, he is with an offer to get that aid out to people right away, and you're blocking it? Well, you know, I wish we had done more to block that unheard of tax cut that was supposed to trickle down and make the economy better. Did it do that? No. I'll tell you what it did do. It got rid well, of wait, wait, wait. I think it's fair to say you, you could argue over whether that was the lone catalyst, but we were doing fine before this virus arrived, right? We got down to three and a half percent unemployment. The economy was chugging along. We had gained about 12 million jobs. I mean, you could make a pretty good argument that we were bouncing back from that, and maybe the cutting regulations, the cutting taxes did that. Well, Neil, look, who are we? I'm doing that because I know uh, I might be right to say is, but the fact of the matter is, uh, W.E., who is that? That ain't the people that I represent. They were not doing well before this virus, and they're doing worse as a result of this virus. The fact of the matter is, how do we keep judging the health care or the health of the economy by what's happening on Wall Street? I judge it by what's happening on Main Street and in some of these communities, Back Street. If they are doing good, then I'm not doing good. 
Because I go to Mars. Well, that's Friday something you're quite church. right, uh, Congressman. You can revisit that. I, I understand yeah. what you're saying, sir, but you can revisit that. But for the time being, on this stimulus measure the president is looking at, are you rejecting it out of hand? Because the president will come back and say, well, I was there to cut the payroll tax. I was there to extend unemployment benefits. These guys didn't come to the table. I did it on my own. Do you look indifferent to something I know you don't like, but it's better than nothing that's already there now, right? Come on. Do the payroll tax only affects people who are on payrolls. If you are on a payroll, the payroll tax doesn't do anything for you. I'm looking out for but, the people. But that's where the other. But isn't that where payroll. the unemployment benefits kick in? But Congress, isn't that where the unemployment benefits kick in? Help for those who have work. Help for those who don't have work. And when the payroll tax that, cut was an issue, you were for it when Barack Obama had it, right? Yeah, and we didn't have a pandemic when Barack Obama was there. We did have a great recession. Remember that. The Great Recession of 2008. I was in the room uh, when it was declared, uh, when OMB and the Secretary of the Treasury came in there and said... But you've already stated things are very bad. You've already stated things are very bad with the pandemic as, as we speak. And, and, and the payroll tax, if it was warranted then, not only once but twice under Barack Obama, why isn't it warranted now? Simply because we did not have a pandemic when he... Uh, did this. We now have a pandemic. We've got people who are sick. We've got over 160,000 people who are dead. That's why the times are different. And so what we've got to do now is get people well, get people out of these nursing homes, out of these hospitals, and back to work. So they can't worry about giving a payroll tax to people who are working we got people in hospital beds, All right. okay? All right, Congressman, I do want to, you were so helpful to Joe Biden um, and, and getting him over the top. Your endorsement was crucial before South Carolina. He won that primary. He never looked back. There's some criticism is of his performance, uh, even though many argue he, he did a good job picking his running mate, Kamala Harris, that he avoids the press. He doesn't take questions. He has sort of like a rope-a-dope strategy to sort of stay away from the media. Do you think he's playing it too cautiously? I think he's doing exactly what he ought to do until these conventions are over. I don't blame him for not getting out of here in front of his own convention. He is not the nominee now. He is still the presumptive nominee. He gets the nomination next week and then have respect for the Republican convention the following week. And after that, game on. And he'll be more active? You think after that point he should be more active, be out there more? Yeah, and I'm going to be out there more. Okay. And a whole lot of other people are going to be All out right. there more. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Congressman, you're always good seeing you. Thank you very much for taking the time and talk to us. Thank I, you, Congressman Clevin, the, of course, the House Majority Whip.